This is CBC Here and Now. Because of this drug, I had no life. It ruined everything for me. A former police officer speaks about his drug addiction. Fired, a longtime St. Anthony doctor is dismissed. A forensic audit for Muskrat Falls, that's what some critics are calling for after a CBC Investigates story. Our blocking pattern continues and so, so does the drizzle and fog along the Atlantic coastline. Again, not so bad inland, especially towards the west coast. The details and your long range are coming up. A police officer speaking about drug addiction, that's fairly common, but a police officer speaking about his own drug addiction, that's another matter. Well, yeah, tonight a former RCMP officer is speaking out about he became addicted to a powerful prescription drug and then helped sue its maker. Now, the central Newfoundland man is a member of a class action lawsuit that recently reached a provisional settlement of $20 million with the drug's maker, Purdue Pharma. Here now is Mark Quinn has our story. OxyContin was supposed to relieve pain, but people in places across North America, like Botwood in central Newfoundland, say it had the opposite effect. Retired RCMP officer George Critchley says the drug did him much more harm than good. George Critchley says darts, this kind, and cigarettes helped him survive his addiction to OxyContin. Critchley says smoking eased his pain when he quit the drug cold turkey. Shaking, my hands would be shaking, my legs would be shaking, my back would be aching, and I would sit by the fireplace here and have my cigarette. Critchley says darts is something you can do even when your back is killing you. But still, quitting OxyContin wasn't easy. It took several months. I could feel like my legs throbbing, my feet throbbing, my arms throbbing, my back throbbing, you know, sweating. Critchley became addicted to OxyContin in the 1990s after he was in a head-on collision in Botwood. His back was badly injured and he's lived with excruciating pain since then. He says OxyContin took a terrible toll. Because of this drug, I had no life. It ruined everything for me. I couldn't travel, I couldn't go anywhere. I did, well, I really didn't want to because of this drug. Critchley signed on to a class action lawsuit about 10 years ago, suing Purdue Pharma, the makers of OxyContin. Last week, a provisional $20 million settlement was reached. Critchley doesn't expect to make much money from it, he wanted to make a point, but he doesn't believe the settlement will really harm Purdue Pharma. $20 million is nothing to us, like myself finding a quarter in a snowbank. Here in Grand Falls, Windsor, a physician who treats chronic pain says doctors have learned from cases like Critchley's. Don't see a lot of Oxycontin anymore at all. Um, it definitely has, a, has some stigma attached to it now because of the court cases and that kind of stuff. Canadian lawyers may not be done with Purdue Pharma just yet. Some U.S. states sued the drug company for hundreds of millions of dollars. And some Canadian provinces are considering doing the same. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Botwood. Well, the deputy mayor of St. John says he has a new appreciation for challenges faced by people with disabilities. After surgery on his knee, Ron Ellsworth is walking on crutches, as you can see here. He says that's helped him realize just how inaccessible many places are, like this washroom at City Hall that's supposed to be wheelchair accessible. But what I'm asking and what I'm going to do myself is look at everything through that lens. That, you know, if this was me living through that, what would the challenge be? If this was me trying to do that, what would the challenge be? And that's what I've focused on over the last month in, in my own uh, mobility pieces. And certainly to get a better understanding. Uh, we know there's issues. In about 25 minutes, we'll take a closer look at what Ellsworth has found dealing with his life on crutches. Well, now to a story from Cornerbrook about a treasured item mistaken as trash. A woman thought her wheelchair was stolen from her driveway. But as here and now's Colleen Connors explains, it turned out to be an honest mistake. A typical scene in Cornerbrook this time of year. It's cleanup week. Piles of garbage and old furniture in front of people's homes, including Samantha Hull's apartment. But on Sunday, after her family got back from a walk, things changed. 
and my pop took the wheelchair out to to take the stroller out and he forgot to put it back in so we came in and didn't even think about it and um, when we went back out to get it it was gone. Cole's family started posting about the missing lifeline. Two days later they got a call. Someone called this morning actually and she was around 50 odd years old and she uses a wheelchair herself and her and her boyfriend is driving around and she said she's seen it and thought it was really a good deal. <laughs> the brand new wheelchair was a bit too close to the giveaway garbage pile. As soon as the couple realized their mistake, they returned it. Cole was not mad, just disappointed. She can't walk far without her chair. She only has one lung and her spinal cord is inflamed. She says she felt really bad because uh, she didn't realize that I needed it right to have this garbage. Cole is very happy to have her wheelchair back. She really pushed herself the days it went missing. I've been mocking. I've been really beating myself out. So, you know, by the t end of the day, I'm ready for bed. Cole can't use her hands to move the wheelchair. She's on the wait list for an automatic one. For the meantime, this treasure, mistaken as trash, will have to do. The city of Cornerbrook issued a statement this morning saying it was not their cleanup crew that took the wheelchair. The couple that mistook it for a free giveaway did apologize, but did not share their names. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, something rare happened near Kitty Vitty Lake today. The province's justice minister traded his suit for a safety vest and acted as a correctional officer for the morning. It was also an opportunity for the media to get a glimpse inside Her Majesty's Penitentiary. The CBC's Arianna Kelland was there. Justice Minister Andrew Parsons unlocking cells instead of his briefcase. There you go. You know, technology here is a little outdated. Yeah. Outdated by about a century and a half. Her Majesty's Penitentiary is aging, crumbling. There's no disputing that. But today it was about correctional officers, and beyond the photo op were real concerns. These officers are rarely seen or heard. About a month ago, they requested that Parsons visit. Today, they showed them their daily routine. In the kitchen, some inmates turn their heads from the cameras. Others appear unfazed. Eight inmates and one civilian cook serve up breakfast. Today, French toast and sausages. This inmate is getting ready to be sentenced. He's heading to the lockup. This is a prisoner transfer van. It is where inmates go when they go from court to HMP. And this is one of the things that Justice Minister Andrew Parsons saw today when he worked as a correctional officer. HMP is at capacity, over 180 inmates. It's no different at the lockup and other provincial facilities. They're all pretty well full also, yeah. The island is pretty well full right now. Critics question if Parsons' visit was anything more than a PR stunt. We simply can't use people who are going through such a hard time as props. And what a cynical thing that will be if this doesn't result in concrete action. Anybody that was in there today, we had a chance to talk to them first. The staff did. In fact, I talked to one uh, individual that was getting transferred to the court. We had a chat beforehand to make sure he was comfortable with this. I mean, we're not going to do anything that exploits their privacy. And, and in many cases, you know, when I come down to meet with the inmates, they want the outside to see the conditions that they face as well. HMP opened before Alcatraz. Many of the updated parts opened just after the Second World War. And with no immediate plans for a new prison, these correctional officers will likely be locking up these ancient cells for years to come. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. And correctional officers do have their hands full. It is now confirmed that there have been two overdoses at HMP. Both happened within the span of three weeks. Prison officials say they are in the process of getting protective gear for staff. 
working with everybody to get this rolled out. Um, you know, as to when it burst onto the scene in St. John's, that's out of our control. Um, it just so happened that it all rolled out at the same time. But this is something that we've been working on for a long time because we've been uh, working with other jurisdictions in Canada. We were aware that it was out there. We knew it was going to hit the East Coast sooner than later. While there are questions in St. Anthony tonight following the termination of a long-serving family physician, Dr. Alexis Carol Guzman worked with Labrador Grenfell Health, but he was let go on Tuesday afternoon. Now he's speaking out about his dismissal and leveling some strong accusations at his former employer. Carol Guzman worked at Curtis Memorial Hospital for 11 years. He admits he wasn't shy about voicing his opinions and believes it may have cost him his job. Carol Guzman said he was tending to patients Tuesday afternoon when he was called in for a meeting with the Health Authority Brass. He was told his contract was being terminated without cause. The doctor says he saw this coming and he's accusing the Health Authority of harassment. Petty stuff, stupid stuff. You didn't do this. You were not here at the exact moment. Very petty. They just wanted to, to make a case to let me go and that has been going on for years. Carol Guzman isn't providing details of his complaints, saying he wants to consult with a lawyer first. He says he never had any intention of leaving St. Anthony and wants residents to question the way he was dismissed. The health authority isn't commenting on the termination, citing privacy concerns. Noreen Goffman is taking some heat tonight for these facial expressions she made. Students at Memorial University say the vice president stuck her tongue out at protesters as she walked into a meeting of the university senate yesterday. Students took to social media to react. Now, some students accuse Golfman of being disrespectful as they face higher tuition rates. They say she appeared to be mocking them, and they are once again pointing to Munn's salaries as being exorbitant. Golfman is denying sticking out her tongue. She says the university is showing it cares by protecting students who are currently enrolled at Munn. <laughs> My intentions are to go to the heart of the North Spur and to lay medicines and to say prayers and to sing a song in honor of uh, the land and of the water and of my people. Well, this was the scene yesterday at the Muskrat Falls site. Protesters walked past security and headed to the North Spur. The group wants an independent review, claiming the North Spur sediment won't hold the reservoir. A safety audit looking into the North Spur was released last month. It found the safety management program met or exceeded industry standards. There is reaction tonight to a CBC Investigate story about the Muskrat Falls project. A former senior engineer has called for a forensic audit to find out why early cost projections were what he calls ridiculously low. A call that was echoed in the House of Assembly today. Here now is Rob Antle was there. This is his report. Construction at Muskrat Falls. Behind schedule and over budget way over budget, billions more than projected when the project got the green light four and a half years ago. A former engineer who worked on Muskrat Falls says those early cost projections were ridiculously low. CBC News has agreed to protect his identity because he's not authorized to speak publicly about his work in Labrador. The engineer says there should be a forensic audit to examine how that happened. Support for that idea today from the opposition. If we learn nothing from this, which could I think could very well turn out to be the biggest debacle in the, in the province's history, uh, then we'll keep on doing it until we start learning some lessons. So I think it's important to understand what went wrong and to avoid this kind of a, of a huge uh, a, a blunder again. Anything that can be done to get details and information to the benefit of the people of the province, I'm all for it. The government not ruling it out. Certainly not opposed to looking at, for, at a forensic audit. Certainly not opposed to, you know, to really questioning. Because we have a lot of questions ourselves. Not opposing it, but not moving forward with it either. Waiting for the Auditor General to finish a broad review of NALCOR. We're going to look at what the Auditor General does uncover and talk to the Auditor General at the time and then consider how we move, how, you know, what's, in, what's the next steps from there. The current CEO of NALCOR says he's focused on the future and getting Muskrat Falls done. But Stan Marshall also says he's not opposed to a forensic audit, calling those early cost estimates unrealistic. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. 
Well, last night during my chat on Facebook Live with the Premier, Dwight Ball said the province's conflict of interest rules need to change. He made the comments after he was questioned about Burn Coffee. Now, Coffee is the lawyer who was the province's top civil servant and recently resigned after coming under fire for representing a client who was suing a Crown Corporation. Now, that raised claims that he was in a conflict of interest. Getting good people into key government uh, positions right now, uh, we need to make sure that we get the proper rules in place. But we also will need people in these uh, positions to help get this government, get this province back on track. And, uh, and in some ways, you know, we just want to make sure we put the proper legislation, the proper rules in place to allow that to happen. We need the best of the best to actually uh, help this province out today. And, and what specific rule changes do you think would allow you to attract the people you need while still maintaining that separation because the public wants to know that someone who's taking a job is doing it to help the public not to help themselves. Absolutely and, and in my particular case you know coming from a, a private life into a public life you know my uh, you, you know anything that I would have been involved in is in a blind trust where it should be those rules are very clear uh, and the conflict of rules uh, the conflict of interest rules and legislation that currently exists as i said 25 years are 25 years old right now outdated and they need to be refreshed they need to be updated so you know the things that you just talked about uh, you know uh, when you look at people in the situation that Burn Coffee was in, I've just explained this, but how you transition into uh, public li private life into public life, we need to make sure we have better measures in place. You need examples on all that. We need to look at conflict of interest legislation that exists at the federal level, at the provincial level, and other provinces. And, you know, let's see what's working for them right here now, and then we get our legislation updated in our province. Well, support for Premier Dwight Ball and his government is dropping, according to a new poll by MQO Research. Ball's personal popularity gets a failing grade. On a scale of 1 to 10, 75 percent of people gave the Premier 5 or less. As for the party, the Liberals sit at 37 percent to the Tories, 39 percent. And that appears to have Paul Davis thinking about the future. Given those numbers, any chance you consider trying to run to replace yourself and stay on? How did I know that question was going to come up? <laughs> uh, look, I asked the party last year to hold a leadership convention. And when I asked, I said that I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be a candidate. And today, I haven't changed my mind on that. But I've also learned that politics never say never. But I certainly haven't changed my position on that as of today. While there's talk that a professional basketball team could soon be dribbling out of mile one, that story after the break. And later, there's plenty of recycling happening in some places, but not in Conception Bay South. We asked the mayor of CBS why more people aren't going green.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Welcome back everyone. Now before we get to the weather, I want to talk about what's happening in southern Quebec and eastern parts of Ontario. Water levels thankfully are down tonight and uh, but we're now just seeing how much damage was done by the uh, flooding and how much debris there is to clean up. It is quite a mess. And the army's still poking, uh, uh, putting uh, sandbags everywhere uh, that they can. Nearly 4,000 people have been flooded out and it may be months before some people can move back home. Fortunately, there is talk of financial help tonight. Provincial and federal officials are promising assistance. Yeah, and Canada's biggest banks are donating half a million dollars to the Red Cross, while the Teamsters Union is going to donate $30,000 to the agency. And as I mentioned on my Facebook page today, when I forwarded some of the footage from uh, above, we can complain about RDF all we want. Mm. It's a lot better than that. <laughs> and it really is all relatively speaking when you talk about uh, the weather in spring. Now, one of the reasons that Ontario has been so soggy, I think, I don't know whether there's been more rain on my dad's farm from his tears or from the <laughs> rain in southern Ontario. Literally, southern Ontario has been so wet this spring. Ottawa, Quebec, we've seen the flooding. The Maritimes have been soggy. One of the reasons is this, and especially over the last week or so, has been this blocking setup. I talk about the blocking high that's parked over Greenland. Well, it's part of a larger picture that they call the Rex block or an Omega block. And the reason it's given that name, when you look at the jet stream, usually it's kind of zonal from west to east. Well, not at all right now. We have these this big... Uh, uh, ampli amplified jet into the north and then back down to the south and it does resemble the Greek letter Omega and that is where it gets its name the Omega block and so we have a big ridge here in the west a big trough here in the east that has been keeping things unsettled and of course the big block over the northern Atlantic which has been bringing in the RDF for most of us not all of us. Another dandy day along the west coast of the island. You have been hogging all the sunshine, western Newfoundland. And uh, yes, we'll start to even things out as we work towards the weekend. Uh, Sunday and into Monday particularly, we'll start to get into a little more in the way of some sunshine here across eastern Newfoundland and the Atlantic coastline. We will talk about that in full detail coming up in your long range. There is that blocking high uh, from the northern Labrador Sea back across to Greenland. There's the low that's uh, still wandering to the south and streaming that rain. 50 millimeters uh, and more expected across Cape Breton by the time it tapers off. Yet just some drizzle across the strait in Port of Basque. That is how sharp these cutoff lines are. Now, as we roll through Thursday, again, the cloud cover dominating. But once again, I'm expecting that we're going to be seeing some sunshine for the west coast and the south coast tomorrow. And in fact, a mild overnight of five, six, seven degrees. Yet along that northeast coast with that north northeasterly flow, we're talking about temperatures near freezing. And the risk is some patchy freezing drizzle to start the day from Bonavista Bay to Nain. And yes, a chance of some drizzle for most areas across across Labrador uh, to start tomorrow as well. A very similar 7 to 7 that we've been seeing from the last couple of days. Metro is a very similar setup tomorrow. Rinse, repeat. Uh, one more day and maybe even another day after that. Uh, Friday we should, I think, see a little bit more in the way of some sunshine breaking in, uh, even for parts of Metro. There is the setup for tomorrow. North northeasterly winds. We are going to be seeing uh, four in, along parts of the water as warm as eight in CBS, 10 St. Mary's towards Placentia. And again, you can see where the model is projecting some of that sunshine breaking through into the afternoon. And I think that's doing a pretty good job there as it has been the last couple of days. Now for the northeast coast into central parts of Newfoundland, again, anywhere from two to six to as warm as eight degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor and Badger to as warm as 10 for Harbor Breton down across that southwest coast. Note the winds again are going to be in from the northeast. So this should help double digit potential from Burgio to Port of Basque, 14 to 15 from Stephenville to Port of Port, Cornerbrook near 13 tomorrow, but the Humber Valley again a little more exposed to that northeast flow, just eight degrees. The northern peninsula, southeastern Labrador, but the sun in the Straits tomorrow. And there is that north coast of Labrador. I think we'll see some sun breaks in Nain tomorrow. Uh, a little more cloud cover down towards Makovic, Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, and back across to the Labrador City Churchill Falls region. Chances some patchy drizzle for all these areas through the day. That is your forecast. Long range details with a little more brightness in it 
coming up. Debbie? Thanks very much, Ryan. Well, two men went to trial today on charges of what was believed to be targeted shootings in St. John's four years ago. For one of those shootings, both are charged with attempted murder. Here and now's Glenn Payette has our story. And a warning, there are images in Glenn's report that some people may find disturbing. 38-year-old Jason Marsh coming towards the camera and 34-year-old Christopher Shaw are accused of doing this to a 21-year-old man on Boyle Street in St. John's in September 2013. The weapon used was a shotgun. Pellets were removed from the man. He had to have surgery. Police marked his hoodie and shirt where they were perforated. A pickup truck in the area also took at least one blast. There are more than 100 dents. This car was also hit. One shotgun shell was found at the scene. It was tested for DNA, but nothing meaningful was found. Among other things, Shaw and Marsh are charged with aggravated assault, assault with a weapon, and with endangering life. More shells of the same type and a shotgun the police seized during their investigation were entered into evidence, but the court hasn't been told yet if this was the weapon used. Two months after the Boyle Street shooting on November 11th, there was another shooting, this one in Williams Heights near Bowering Park. The pair is charged with attempted murder for that one. In a sense, this trial is going to be like two trials, one dealing with the Boyle Street shooting, the other dealing with the Williams Heights incident. The man that Marsh and Shaw are accused of shooting on Boyle Street is expected to take the stand tomorrow. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the idea of attracting a professional basketball team to St. John's is gaining momentum. With the American Hockey League gone, Mile One is looking for a new anchor tenant. The National Basketball League of Canada says a decision on relocating a team to St. John's could come within 30 days. The commissioner visited Mile One last month and says the market and the venue are a perfect fit for the league. There's been talk of a Quebec major junior hockey team setting up here, but the league is dismissing that idea. And from sports to arts, singer-songwriter Sarah Harmer is going to be the big headliner at this year's Newfoundland and Labrador Folk Festival. The 41st annual gathering will take place August 4th to 6th in Bannerman Park in St. John's. For a weekend pass, it'll cost you 135 bucks. If you're a student or a senior, you'll pay $100, taxes included. The other acts include Kelly Russell on the Planks and Amelia Curran. But Chair John Drover says there'll be lots of artists from right across the country. Last year, of course, was the 40th annual Newfoundland and Labrador Folk Festival, and we drew heavily on acts from Newfoundland and Labrador. This year, 2017, is Canada's 150, and uh, while we didn't make any commitment to do it, we kind of set ourselves a mandate to try to find an act from every province and territory across the country. While the deputy mayor of St. John says he's had an epiphany since a leg injury left him unable to walk without crutches, now Ron Ellsworth wants the city to pay more attention to the needs of the disabled. We'll have that story after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. St. John's Deputy Mayor Ron Ellsworth took a fall on his driveway and now after surgery, he's back walking but with crutches. That experience has opened his eyes to just how inaccessible some buildings are. I met up with him to find out about some of the problems at City Hall. These washrooms here on the fourth floor are identified as wheelchair accessible. But you know, first thing I gotta do is try to get the door open, brace it with my crutch and, and try to get in through the door itself. Then when you get into this door, then there's a second door that you kind of got to get in through in order to get into the bathroom. You have to do the same thing. It's a fairly heavy door, so you got to push it back through. Once again, prop it open with your crutch and, and get in through. And th this is what people do every day. I went from a walker originally for the first two weeks. Uh, there was no mobility because of what we're doing. Once I got to the crutches, that gave me uh, the ability to get out around a little bit more and to get a little more mobile. And that's when you start to realize a little more that even the smaller things that um, you've probably seen before but never really understood that it's a problem uh, when you're walking with you know, walking aids of some sort. Uh, Air at City Hall, for example, you know, the main door going in through our offices. While there's an opener on the door, there's actually a small lift uh, ramp type thing right from the doorway. So you actually got to go up a small incline in order to get in. So, you know, being a little bit unstable on your legs makes a little bit of a challenge. You know, just by the width of stalls alone, it's very clearly that, you know, they're not wheelchair accessible. They may be usable, but not accessible. Uh, you know, the toilets that are here are lower, uh, lower uh, height toilets, which cause an issue for people with mobility. Those should be higher up. Um, you know, the room within the stalls is very limiting. So, you know, we, we got to do better here. Uh, this is an older building, as I said earlier, and certainly uh, some opportunities for us to make some changes. Uh, if we employed the universal design piece, uh, these things wouldn't be happening within uh, City Hall and within our own buildings. How frustrating has it been to try and do some things that you used to take for granted? Well, it gives you a different perspective, you know, uh, and, and Peter, for the record, like, I fully understand that I'm on a very short window, there's a very short hiccup in my number of the day, so I certainly don't want to diminish anything that anybody's going through in their own life. But for me, it's been a good learning opportunity, just the small things in the run of a day where you've lost your independence. You can't get up and go as you always went. You've got to rely on other people to transport you to get where you need to be. You've got to rely on, when you get there, other people being able to help you. What I asked council on Monday was to consider, you know, everything that we look at from accessibility and inclusion, look at it with a universal design in mind because it's not just persons with disabilities. Yeah, you know, we got families with strollers. We got a lot of senior folks in our community. We got a lot of people out there who are trying to get around and be a part of the city. But because of the limitations uh, that are just generic there, we need to do better. This morning I got an email from a lady who talked about a friend of hers who's a quadriplegic trying to go up Duckworth Street just on the sidewalks because of the winter weather, you know, the, the pavement, the concrete shifts and moves and you get uh, elevation changes in concrete. So there's a lot of things we need to be looking at as we're moving forward and doing things. And the universal design, uh, which Coalition of Persons with Disabilities has done a lot of work on, is certainly a good place for us to be working out of. What would you say to some people who maybe have a disability or who've been advocates in this field who say, you know, look at you and say, it, it wasn't until this was something that personally affected you that you really opened your eyes. But this is, you know, these inaccessibilities didn't just pop up recently. They've been here for a long time. So my first experience in working with personal disabilities was my time on school board back in around 2000. Um, that's what got, in, got me introduced to the disability piece. And you're right, sometimes lived experiences are the real experiences and the reality of life. As I said earlier, I don't want this to be, you know, that I understand all this in any way, shape, form. I don't. But what I'm asking and what I'm going to do myself is look at everything through that lens. That, you know, if this was me living through that, what would the challenge be? If this is me trying to do that, what would the challenge be? And that's what I've focused on over the last month in, in my own uh, mobility pieces. And certainly to get a better understanding. Uh, we know there's issues. We know that we've got a responsibility. We know that there's equality and we need to make sure that we know all that. But outside of making things accessible, it's about making things uh, usable. You know, some simple things like instead of using round doorknobs, using lever doorknobs so that, you know, people who have a problem grabbing a doorknob can open the door. Those are things that, you know, are a lot of work being done on it and brought forward. Um, I've been a strong voice for accessibility and inclusion for a long time. This just strengthens my resolve to be more active, more involved, and to encourage others to keep their uh, eyes open and uh, to look at a broader scope uh, than just the physical barriers that are in place.
After the break, more from the retired police officer who is talking publicly about his own drug addiction. Welcome back, and now back to our top story tonight. A police officer in Botwood who became addicted to OxyContin and then quit cold turkey. He spoke with Here and Now's Mark Quinn, and here's more of their conversation. My grandson came along and uh, uh, when I was growing up in Ontario, and I said, well, if I don't give this up, I'm, ne I'm never getting to visit in Ontario. So I, uh, I just threw it down, and I suffered. And I mean, every bone in my body ached. It seemed like every nerve I could feel, and it was, it was terrible. It was hell on earth. That's what it was. So you just gave it up? Cold I just, turkey. I just dropped a cold turkey. It's just wonder my heart never gave out altogether. You know, what was that I like wouldn't a... be talking to you now, actually, if if that sure. was the case. But the, uh, uh, I've no, heard that's really that's really hard to do. I heard that's really painful. It is but if, if the motivation is there and you have the willpower you can do it but the motivation was there for me and i said well this is it i'm just throwing it down and i'm going to suffer through it and i think it was three to four months wow. before like there's a fireplace next to my right well i had quit smoking for 13 years and i started smoking when i was on oxycontin again so what I would do is I, was, I always smoke outside, but I would sit by this fireplace shaking. My hands would be shaking, my legs would be shaking, my back would be aching. And I would sit by the fireplace there and have my cigarette until it got to a point of, oh, I'm starting to feel better. And, and like I say, that was a long, long period of time before I started to get back to, to normal. I've heard people describe that as you know physical pain and a craving that really oh, hurts. The, 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 the physical pain is hard to describe. It is, it's like you have a pulse everywhere. I could feel like my legs throbbing, my feet throbbing, my arms throbbing, my back throbbing, you know, sweating. And just, well, I wouldn't be able to carry on this conversation with you under, under those circumstances because I wouldn't be able to uh, sit 
and carry on a normal conversation because the pain would be just too much. And, and it's like a person who just quit smoking. Normally they get agitated easily and that's the way I was. I was, you know, I, I don't even know if the wife hardly, hardly spoke to me in that amount of time because, I, well, I don't want to agitate George any more than he already is trying to give up this drug. But eventually, uh, I got through it. And I said to myself, I said, well, never again. Now I have to take pills for my uh, heart, and that where I had the heart attack, and that, but no more of this uh, uh, Oxycontin. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. You know, Ryan, I don't mind the RDF so much during the week as long as you can promise me a decent weekend when I actually have the time to go out and enjoy it. So. Yeah. Pressure's on. Pressure's on. Yeah, well, it will certainly be brightening uh, for eastern parts of Newfoundland, the Atlantic coastline, where, again, we're socked in right now and have been the last couple of days. Lots of fog and drizzle, but brightening towards the weekend. Not so much warming. Brightening. That doesn't sound like sun. It, no, brightening it for sure is sun. Uh, sun okay. for Sunday. Uh, Saturday, I, I'm still kind of uh, not too optimistic about it. I'll show you why. Uh, here is how things are playing out in terms of highs today across Atlanta, Canada. Have a look. 13 in Cornerbrook today. That was the hot spot across Atlantic Canada in, in most cases anyway. Uh, and there's the setup. Northeast flow, the sun out on the west coast, nicely shielded from that uh, northeast flow and even parts of the south coast, a beautiful evening in the, on the Buren Peninsula back towards uh, uh, the St. Pierre region. Lots of sunshine there on the webcams, but not so much here in the east where it is yeah, socked in. There's the rain that is rolling up through the Maritimes right now and this blocking high, which is the reason that that rain is not edging into our neck of the woods, but staying parked to our south, uh, that high will pretty much wander around just to the north of Labrador over the next day or so. There are your temperatures for tomorrow. Once again, three, four degrees along that northeast coast, even a little bit cooler if you're standing right along the coast. Places like Twillingate, just two. Double-digit potentials, however, from Placentia Bay to the Buren to Port of Basque, and of course the west coast will again be dandy tomorrow. Uh, some sun breaks possible from the Straits to Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador City, but I do think the cloud cover will for the most part dominate. Uh, but yeah, some sun in the mix there. Now, as we roll into the Friday time period, uh, this high will actually wander into Labrador, and so we will see a better Friday shaping up there. Newfoundland will, I think, see a little more in the way of sunshine as well, and not ruling out a sunbreak or two in the metro region for Friday with a little bit drier air in place, although temperatures are still going to be quite chilly, and I do think we'll see some drizzle and fog in the morning, but a better chance of some sun into the mix for the afternoon. Uh, 10 degrees in central parts of Newfoundland, cooler along the northeast coast, 13 for the west coast, 6 to 12 in through Labrador. And as we roll into your Saturday time period, again, this is why I'm still not really buying the Saturday sun is with this area of high pressure in place. It's a little bit far to the west, and I do think that's enough that we'll see some cloud cover draped over parts of the coast, a chance of seeing some drizzle into the morning hours in particular with uh, some fog patches into the mix. Uh, not ruling it out, uh, but uh, for Metro itself and up the northeast coast, still thinking the cloud cover dominates for Saturday. Things will change as we move into the Sunday time period, however, with a mix of sun and cloud at 7 to as warm as 8 degrees, talking about 15 to 16 for western and central parts of Newfoundland. So Sunday certainly looking like the better day for the weekend. Sun and cloud across Labrador as well. And this is why Saturday into Sunday, that area of high pressure will actually move right overhead. And so that will allow some drier air to come in and uh, some breaks of sun. Now as we move into Monday, there's the southerly flow with our next system. And so while we will warm up, we're also going to be seeing a bit of rain coming in. So yeah, back to double digits Monday with increasing clouds. The rain comes in Tuesday, uh, but at least it's a little bit warmer. Back-to-back -back double digit days will take it. Uh, and uh, for uh, Labrador, again, a pretty nice looking weekend uh, with uh, some rain chances into mid next week. Let's meet our athlete of the day.
We'd like to introduce you to Brady Thorne. Brady is six years old and comes from Whitburn. Yeah, Brady joined Trinity Taekwondo in the last year. He practices twice a week and is currently working on his yellow belt. We salute you, Brady, as today's Young Athlete of the Day. We've all heard of the mantra, reduce, reuse, recycle, to get people to cut down on the amount of waste that goes into our environment. Seems not everyone is catching on to the three R's. I'm going to speak with the mayor of CBS right after this break. It's the R word that isn't getting much traction in the town of Conception Bay South. Recycling is a great way to cut down on unnecessary waste in landfills. But in CBS, only a fraction of what's being put out at the curb is ending up here to be recycled. And Mayor Steve Tessier is joining me now. Well, just how much is being recycled in your town? Debbie, we're recycling about 6%, which is dismal. Dismal. Dismal, yes. How does that stack up with other municipalities? Uh, St. John's, I believe, is around 10. Uh, I'm not sure what the other municipalities are, are recording right now, so we're just sort of starting to get our numbers in from last year. But uh, I look at 6% and that's, uh, that's low. Now, you've had your recycling program since 2013. Have those numbers changed at all? We've dropped off, actually. Yeah. Why? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, just people not getting involved, not sort of taking it on as a, as a serious uh, household chore to do, you know, and uh, it, we make it very easy for them. We pick it up every two weeks. It's, uh, it's a blue bag recycling program, no different than, than any of the other municipalities. So uh, it's a pretty simple process. You know, I have it in my house with three bins that I put my garbage in one paper and then plastic. So I mean, it's, it's a pretty pro easy process when you get going at it, you know. Now, I have heard from some residents that uh, some of the bags, the blue bags being left not being picked up for non-compliance. Yes, They've got right. materials in there that they shouldn't. Is that kind of a turn-off, do you think? I, I don't think so. I think there's, you know, like I've made that mistake myself that I might have put a glass bottle in with the plastic, for example, and they'll leave it on my curb as well. And, uh, but it all has more to do with the uh, regional facility in the sorting system. So if, we, if there's too much, what they call cross-contamination, uh, they won't pick up the, uh, they won't pick it up. And uh, it's, you know, it's very easy to fix for me. I just took the two glass bottles out and seal it up again and put it out the next day and next week and 
off of wind. Okay, so what are you actively doing to encourage people to recycle in a town that you say is dismal at it? Well, we're going to get, a, uh, get some more messaging out. I know we spend a lot of money. I know the region spends a lot of money on uh, MMSB and the City of St. John's and through the Regional Services Board. Spends a lot of money on educating people and asking them to recycle. We'll do a little bit more ourselves in our own messaging throughout the town to say, listen, you know, social media, whatever. Listen, you know, try to increase it. If we can get it up to, I think it was 20%, we'd save about $70,000, which is significant, you know, it's because uh, that money comes right out of our programming. Well, I was going to ask you about uh, the fact that obviously recycling is good for the environment, but yeah. your town is losing out on a lot of money, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's significant dollars. I mean, you know, people complain about taxes. We all do. And, uh, you know, when you when you take 60 or 70 or $80,000 out of your, your programming to do, you know, uh, garbage, uh, it's a it's significant amount of money. And... Uh, even if they, you know, people, I know everybody can, cares about the environment, but if they care about their money, you know, they should, you know, look into recycling. Maybe that should be the centerpiece of <laughs> a new should, education yeah. program. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> if you like your money, keep it in your pockets, recycle. Yeah, you know? and you could be specific about where it could be used in your yeah. town. Exactly, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize that it costs us about $68 a ton for garbage, $20 a ton for recycling. So just do the math on that. For every ton of garbage that the town picks up and brings to the landfill, we pay $68. If it's recycling, it's 20 It's a significant difference. And if we can just close that gap the other way, it'll uh, reflect back on the, uh, in the programs and services in the town. What about some of the options that you might have considered? For instance, how feasible is it to make recycling compulsory? Uh, I've, I've traveled a fair bit with different uh, you know, c conferences and stuff and, and some of the municipalities are going, such as Mount Pearl now, are going with this clear bag recycling. It's a mandatory clear bag recycling that you get one personal bag inside of a clear bag of your garbage and the rest is recycled and if you don't comply they won't pick up your garbage. So I, I don't know if uh, the town of Conception Bay South is prepared to go that far yet but it may come to a point in time where that becomes mandatory for the whole region. So. We'll have to wait and see, but uh, I'd much prefer people just cooperated and, you know, took it on themselves. Any other options that you're considering? Well, again, you know, there's, there's always, uh, I guess, lots of options out there. I mean, even if you want to give your recycling to service groups, I mean, there's an easy way for these people to pick up some cash and, you know, do some do some good that way. If, that, if they don't want to, you know, have, go through the trouble of putting it to the curb, you know, it's just service groups that are collecting Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, are collecting recyclables, so maybe that's an option for them, you know. Any parting message? Please recycle. If you like, don't like paying taxes and you like your money, recycle. If you like the environment, recycle. It's pretty simple. <laughs> Mayor Steve Tessier, thank you very much. Oh, thank you for your time, Debbie. Appreciate it. Well, British Columbia's Liberals have retained their hold on power, but just barely. Yesterday's general election was the closest in BC history. The Liberal Party lost its majority that it held for 16 years, coming up one seat short. The NDP finished second by a slim margin, and the Green Party may hold the balance of power after an historic gain. Recounts are being conducted, and absentee ballots are yet to be tallied, which could mean the results could change in the coming weeks. We'll be back after...
Welcome back to Hero Now, and there may be a life-saving tip in this next story. Just watch closely. Now, this is for everyone who heads down to Florida. This brave 10-year-old girl is in Orlando. She wrestled herself from the grip of an alligator, and get this, by putting her fingers in the reptile's nose. She was in an Orlando lake when the three-meter gator chomped down on her leg. That's no small gator. Three meters. She remembered a survival trick she learned at a gator theme park, so she plugged the alligator's nose so it couldn't breathe, and it opened its mouth. A dozen stitches later, and Juliana Juliana, or Juliana, is doing fine. Yeah, she says she figures it mistook her for a ginormous piece of chicken. <laughs> And if you're ever in her shoes, at least now you know what to do. I hope I'm never in her shoes. Yeah, no. if there are alligators <laughs> anywhere near anywhere that I'm swimming, um, I'm not swimming there. No, exactly. Doesn't matter how warm the water is. She's very lucky, though, that she uh, had the presence of mind. Could have been a very different story. And I guess some parts of the world you deal with alligators, some parts of the world you deal with polar bears. So, you know, there's... There it is. Some parts of the world, you deal with <laughs> relentless RDF. And Can that is what we're looking at Mike again is. tomorrow. St. John's, the northeast coast, up towards St. Anthony, and up towards the coast of Labrador as well. Perhaps a few sun breaks in Nain, back towards Labrador City, Happy Valley, Goose Bay. The west coast will be the best coast yet again for tomorrow. And the south coast, not too bad either. And as we look at our viewer picture of the day, clouds oh. and uh, those are uh, lenticular clouds that are over top of the long range mountains there which are also snow capped and what a picture there from Leighton Johnson Jr. on the Great it's Northern gorgeous. Peninsula. It looks soft like cotton wool or something. It's just so it's beautiful. pleasing. Yeah. Also uh, a picture I don't have here but remember the piebald moose from uh, the white moose yep. from the west coast from last summer. He's back, and I've got a picture of him oh, on my Facebook good. page. So let me share that tomorrow, but if you want to check it out, it's on my Facebook page now. Okay. See you all tomorrow, Have everyone. a good night. Good night.